Amen. Go ahead and take a seat. It is so good to be here with you today. Uh, if you have your Bible or Bible app, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 13. It might surprise you, but we are continuing in our sermon series from the Gospel of Luke. And for the rest of the year, we'll be teaching and preaching from the Gospel of Luke. Now, if you did not bring a Bible with you today, that's quite all right. We have a Bible for you. If you'll reach under the seat in front of you, grab one of those Bibles and turn to page 1037. You'll find Luke chapter 13 on page 1037. And as always... If you don't have a Bible that you can read or understand easily, we want to invite you to take one of our Bibles home with you. There's a stamp in there that says Calvary Baptist Church. Just scratch that out of there and write your name, write your address, your cell phone, make it your own Bible. We want you to have a copy of God's Word because at Calvary, we really believe if we read God's Word and we apply His Word, He will transform and change our lives. It happens over and over again again. That's why we give out so many Bibles. Uh, Parker Campus, we want to welcome you tonight. We're so glad that you are joining us today. Uh, God is at work among you. It is so incredible to talk to Pastor Ruben every single week in our pastoral staff meeting, and he shares stories about baptism. He shares stories about life change. It is so incredible how God is working among you. So we're glad that you're here. I'm glad that you're here, and our campus is going to show that we're glad you're here on the count of three, one, two, three. Now, in today's passage of scripture, uh, we read about Jesus once again breaking the rules that the religious leaders put in place about keeping the Sabbath day holy. Now, throughout the Gospel of Luke, we've looked at this. Whenever Jesus heals on the Sabbath, the very first thing that the religious leaders do is complain. Now, before we dive into our passage of scripture, I think it's important that we really kind of all get on the same page page as far as why the Jewish leaders got so upset when Jesus would heal somebody on the Sabbath. Because in our minds, it would make sense. It would make sense that somebody would experience life change on the Sabbath day. It would make sense that somebody would experience a, a transformed life or healing power when they're worshiping God on the Sabbath. So for the religious leaders, that wasn't the case. And today I wanna to make sure that we all understand why it was so irritating to the religious leaders when Jesus would heal on the Sabbath. Now in the 10 commandments, we see that God kind of provided a, a pattern for the nation of Israel to live by, that they were to work six days. And then on the seventh day, they were to cease from working. They were to stop working. God wanted the Israelites to set aside one day of the week to demonstrate that they fully do trust in God. Now, it, it's important be, to understand that the nation of Israel, they were a nation of farmers. Uh, they were a nation of, they worked the cattle, they worked the crops, uh, they labored. But on the seventh day, they stopped. On the seventh day, it was an opportunity for them to demonstrate we don't have to water the crop. We don't have to take care of the animals. Uh, we don't have to labor. It was a sign that said, we trust God enough that we can stop our labor and we can worship him. It was God saying to the Israelites, I'm going to take care of you, just trust me. Now that idea of ceasing from all work is very appealing, uh, especially in today's world. Uh, we don't stop work at the end of our work schedule. For many parents, that's when work really gets in place. Uh, that's when we rush home after school. We rush to get homework done. We rush to the soccer fields or we rush to the baseball fields or we rush to the softball fields or to the track. We rush to get the kids supper after practice is over. We rush to get them showered and into bed. And then we rush to school the next morning after breakfast. Then we rush to work so we're not late. 
It's, it's like life really never stops. There's always something happening in our lives. We're always going, we're always rushing, whether we're on the clock or not, we are busy. So this idea that God instituted about resting one day a week, it's very appealing. God said, be busy, but don't go crazy. Work hard from sunup till sundown, but on the seventh day, stop. It's appealing, but the religious leaders took the responsibility to explain what it meant to work on the Sabbath and what it meant to not work on the Sabbath. They took it on their shoulders. They put words into God's mouth and they actually began telling the people how they needed to live on the Sabbath day. Stopping on the Sabbath day wasn't enough. God saying to cease and to rest on the Sabbath wasn't enough. They developed over 39 rules to describe what it meant to work and not work on the Sabbath. And some of those rules, just a few of them, if you were a tailor, meaning you sewed clothes for a living and you walked out of your house on the Sabbath day and you happened to leave a sewing needle in your garment, you were accused of working on the Sabbath. Or if you are a woman and you wore a wig, raise your hand if, no, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Raise your hand if you wore a wig. If you wore a wig on the Sabbath or if you wore a clip in your hair, you were accused of working on the Sabbath. Uh, You were carrying a load on the Sabbath. You were carrying your wig and you were carrying the clip and it gets better. If you had artificial teeth, we call them false teeth today, if you had false teeth, you were not allowed to put them in on the Sabbath. You had to walk around like that, right? You couldn't put them in because you would be accused of carrying a load and working on the Sabbath. And if you were a man and you picked up your child on the Sabbath, you were accused of working on the Sabbath. So the religious leaders really went above and beyond. They added to what God wanted for the Israelites. God just wanted them to stop and enjoy a day of worship, enjoy time with family, enjoy time in community with others and celebrate their relationship with God or or their connection to God. But the religious leader said, we know exactly what you need to do in order to do that. And if you have ever grown up in a church that focused on rules as opposed to a relationship with Jesus, you know exactly what these Jewish people felt then. You know exactly that type of burden that these, uh, the Jewish people felt that was handed to them by the religious leaders. So then, in all of this context, and all of this understanding of the Sabbath, what did Jesus constantly do on the Sabbath? He healed people on the Sabbath, which the religious leaders considered offensive and they thought that he was working on the Sabbath, right? It blows my mind because he was changing people's lives. He was restoring sight and he was healing deformities and casting out demons, but they didn't care. They were bothered that Jesus broke their rules as opposed to changing people's lives for the better. So now that we understand that, I want us to take a look in Luke chapter 13 as Jesus once again encounters the religious leaders and their stubbornness about following the rules that they've established. Luke chapter 13, beginning in verse 10. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath and behold, there was a woman who had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully strengthen herself, uh, straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and she glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, there are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed and not on the Sabbath day. Then the Lord answered him, 
You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? As he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame and all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. So here's Jesus. He's teaching in the synagogue. And as he's teaching, in really creeps this woman who is bent over double, who cannot straighten herself out. And she had lived like that for almost two decades. Her back was so crooked, it was so painful that as she walked into the synagogue, completely doubled over, I'm sure she was arching her face just to be able to see clearly uh, the path in front of her. Now I've seen older men and I've seen older women who have that condition where they're completely doubled over. You have probably seen men and women like that as well. That you've seen them, they're, they're literally crippled in pain and yet they're still out and they're still moving and they're still trying to live their life. So even though it was the Sabbath, as Jesus was teaching, the moment he saw her, he called her over to him and he said, woman, you are freed from your disability. But instead of celebrating her healing, instead of celebrating the fact that she had been changed, the ruler of the synagogue continued to beat the same annoying drum. Instead of being happy for her freedom, he complained because Jesus had worked on the Sabbath day. Now let it sink in for just a moment. Imagine this is your mother, your sister, a friend, a neighbor. For 18 years, this woman was bent over in pain. She suffered for 18 years. She was unable to stand, walk, or sleep well. But for Jesus, he saw her pain. He saw that she had been really in agony for 18 years. And he said, even though the religious leader did not care about the length of her suffering, he said, since she has suffered so long, shouldn't the Sabbath be a day where she is set free? Shouldn't she be freed from this deformity on the Sabbath day? Now her suffering reminds us of this that sometimes pain can last a long time. Sometimes pain that we experience in this life lasts too long. For 18 years, this woman could not straighten herself out. That's 936 weeks, 216 months, 6,570 days, this woman could not stand up straight by herself. She walked from place to place, doubled over, straining her neck and her face to try to see where she was going. This wasn't just a few days of darkness for her. This wasn't just a bad day at the office. This wasn't a flat tire. This wasn't something crazy and unexplainable that happened to her that day. This pain lasted a significant amount of time. When she woke up in the morning, the pain was there. When she went to bed at night, the pain was there. At breakfast, at lunch, at dinner, the pain was there. Her disfigurement was there. She felt as though she was hideous to all those around her all the time, every day. It never went away. It didn't fade with time. It didn't get better with time. Now, I know that some of you might understand that experience of pain. Whether it's a physical pain or whether it's a spiritual pain or whether it's an emotional pain, a mental pain, 
Some of you have experienced what it's like to walk in darkness for a long time. You wake up in the morning and the very first sensation you have is that of pain. Maybe you're haunted by pain from your past that just doesn't seem to go away. Maybe you caused hurt to somebody that you loved or maybe someone you loved caused hurt to you. Maybe you've experienced a lengthy amount of pain in your marriage and you just don't know when it's going to get any better. Or, or maybe you've experienced a great deal of pain in relationships with your children. Or maybe daily you struggle under the weight of mental pain and mental darkness. And maybe you feel overwhelmed because dark thoughts and dark clouds seem to choke out the joy that you once had in life. And maybe those thoughts linger in your mind for weeks and months at a time and you can't exercise them away and you can't vitamin them away. You can't even pray them away and you can't shake them off. You just feel the pain that lingers every single day. See, there's some pain that lasts for moments, but there's other pain that lasts way too long. And sometimes as people experience that type of darkness and that type of pain, whether it's physical, emotional, uh, uh, mental, or spiritual, sometimes they get swallowed up by the pain and they end their life because they just can't take it anymore. I think that's the type of pain that this woman had for 18 years. Did you know that suicide is the 12th leading cause of death here in our United States? In 2020, nearly 46,000 Americans ended their life by suicide and nearly 1.2 million people attempted suicide on top of that. I, I want you to know that if you struggle with dark thoughts and, and if you struggle with lasting pain in your life, I want to encourage you to consider signing up for our suicide prevention workshop. It's gonna be coming up in September on Saturday, September 10th from nine o'clock to two o'clock at our McCulloch campus. Let me tell you something. If you struggle with those types of thoughts and you struggle with that darkness and you struggle with ongoing pain that lasts forever, I want you to know that you are not alone. You don't have to pretend to be a superhero. You don't have to pretend that you've got everything together and smile on the outside, especially if you're consider, considering harming yourself. If you've been suffering for a long time, do what this woman did. Keep dragging your tail to church. Keep dragging yourself into a place where there are people who are lifting their hands in worship. Keep putting yourself in the presence of God. Keep moving forward, even though it hurts. We also have a ministry called Celebrate Recovery. They meet every, I love our CR folks, which should be all of us, by the way. Celebrate Recovery meets every Monday night at 6.30 in this room. If you have a habit, if you have a hurt, if you have a hang up in your life that you want to get rid of and you're just trying to recover from it, attend Celebrate Recovery. Be a part of it. Let yourself go in the worship. Get into a small group with other people and talk about your hurts, habits, and hangups. Open your heart up to God and invite him to begin to work. CR is a place where you can experience recovery, but you've got to take that step. At Calvary, I want you to know we are for you and we believe God loves you deeply. And I want to also invite you to cling to the hope that we find in Jesus because consistently throughout scripture, Jesus changes lives of hurting people. That, that's what we see overwhelmingly throughout scripture. I mean, Jesus is not this holy man that's unapproachable. Throughout the New Testament, we see Jesus over and over again healing 
people. And as we've walked through the gospel of Luke since January, I'm just gonna throw out all the events where Jesus changed the lives of somebody in the gospel of Luke. You don't have to write this down and you're not gonna keep up, okay? But be encouraged in your heart. In Luke 4.35, Jesus healed a man possessed by an evil spirit. In Luke 4.39, Jesus healed a woman with a high fever. In Luke 4.40, Jesus healed those who were brought to him from an entire village. Everybody with a disease, everyone who was demon possessed, anybody who was sick, Jesus healed them. In Luke 5.13, Jesus healed a man with an advanced case of leprosy. In Luke 5, 24, Jesus healed a paralyzed man. In Luke 6, 10, 6, 10, Jesus healed a man with a deformed hand. In Luke 7, 10, Jesus healed the officer's servant. In Luke 7, 14, Jesus walked over to a grieving mother whose son has died, whose son had died, and raised him back to life. In Luke 7, 21, again, Jesus cured an entire village, many people of their diseases, illnesses, and blindness. In Luke 8.33, Jesus healed a man who was filled with many demons. In Luke 8.43, Jesus healed a woman who was too embarrassed to, to ask him for healing. She reached out to him and touched the hem of his robe and his healing power flew through him anyway. In Luke 9.6, Jesus sent his disciples out into the villages where they healed the sick. In Luke 9.10, Jesus fed over 5,000 people who were simply hungry. In Luke 9.42, Jesus healed a boy with seizures. In Luke 10, Jesus sent out another 72 of his disciples to bring more healing to other people. In Luke 11.14, Jesus healed a man who couldn't speak. And here in this passage, in Luke chapter 13, Jesus healed a woman who had been bent over double for 18 years. Chapter after chapter, day after day, verse after verse, we see Jesus changing the lives of people who are hurting. He rescued people from disease, from death, from deformity, from demons, and from darkness. Now, if you're an Old Testament person, or if you're a person that has grown up in the church, you might say something like this. Yeah, but Jesus had to do that to fulfill prophecy. I mean, that's why he, he healed people. And I would say this to you. Yes, Jesus did that to fulfill prophecy, but he could have gotten away with only healing a few blind people. He could have gotten away with healing only a few people who needed the healing touch in their lives. But instead, any person... Any person who came to Jesus received healing. Any person who came to Jesus and asked him for grace and mercy and asked him to bring healing and change to their lives, Jesus healed them, every single one. He chose to pour out his life to meet the needs of those who were hurting and those who were struggling around him and those people who were living without hope. And the reason for that is simple. He wasn't walking through a checklist. He genuinely loved people. He genuinely cared for every person that he encountered. And Jesus is really concerned about you. Jesus is concerned about you. Your mom may not be, your dad may not be, your kids may not be, your spouse may not be. Jesus cares deeply for you. Your life matters to him. Your joy matters to him. Your pain and your darkness does not go unnoticed. And by the way, your obedience, if you're a follower of Jesus, your obedience matters to him as well. He knows if you apply his word to your life and he knows that if you apply his teachings to your life, your life is going to get better. He knows if you begin to apply his word to your life, your marriage is going to get better. As you apply his word to your, your personal life, your character is gonna deepen, your life is going to change for the better. You are important, you do matter. So please remember this, 
Miracles still happen and God is not bound by rules. Miracles still happen and God is not bound by rules. We can't limit God. We can't stop God. We can't prevent God from working. If God wants to work in our lives, he's going to work in our lives. If God wants to rescue you, he might bring you to the point of brokenness so that you humble yourself and call out to him and experience his powerful transformation. The greatest miracle that has happened in my life is when I surrendered my life to Jesus and I received forgiveness for my sins. It's not about healing from my childhood. It's not about healing from my past. The greatest thing that I ever experienced, the greatest miracle that has ever occurred is Jesus forgiving me for my sin. I came to a point in my life like this doubled over woman came to Jesus. I came to a point in my life that when I realized that Jesus was the only one who offered hope and could offer me peace and could offer me joy and rescue me. I realized that God had created mankind and mankind had rebelled against him. God had a relationship with Adam and Eve and Adam and Eve said, we don't need you to tell us how to live. They chose to rebel against God and since Adam and Eve did that, every human being that has ever been born has rebelled against God. We hurt others, we lie, we're selfish, we lust, we live content with the world to revolve around us. We call it, in today's world, doing what I wanna do, living how I want to live, living to satisfy myself. And God calls that sin. You were created for a greater purpose than satisfying yourself. You were created for the greatest purpose of all, which which is to bring glory to God and experience an incredible loving relationship with him, to live out a life that has been transformed by the work of Jesus. When we choose to do what we want and we choose to focus on ourselves, uh, we might call it living how I wanna live, but God calls it sin and disobedience. And just like every loving parent has consequences when their kids act rebellious, God has a punishment for us because of our sin. The punishment for our sin is eternal separation from God forever. Romans 6, 23 says the wages of sin is death. The penalty for sin is death. And the greatest moment in my life happened when I realized I deserved to die eternally, that I deserved hell because of my sin. When I realized that I should get what I deserved, but then I, I recognize the second half of Romans 6, 23, that the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. That's when my heart started becoming alive. That's when my life started to change. That's when I began to experience the presence of God. And I said, I want Jesus in my life. Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Just like Jesus demonstrated his love toward this broken woman, he demonstrates his love for you and I by being willing to pay the price for our sins on the cross. It was in that moment where I understood what Jesus had done for me, that he gave up his life, that he paid the penalty for my sin, When I understood it was for a purpose to bring me close to God, 1 Peter 3.18 says, Christ suffered once for our sins, the just for the unjust, so he could bring us to God. When I understood that, I surrendered my life to Jesus. I gave my life to him. I was changed, I was transformed, I received forgiveness. That is the greatest miracle that could ever happen in your life the miracle of complete surrender, the miracle of complete commitment to Jesus, surrendering your life, recognizing that there is no way you earn forgiveness for sins, but that God loves you, Christ gave his life for you, and he wants to have a relationship with you because he loves you. 
He cares for you. And if you would like to surrender your life to Jesus today, our prayer team is gonna be here at the close of the service after the last song. If you wanna surrender your life to Jesus, if you wanna commit your life to following him, to receive forgiveness for your sins and experience what the Bible talks about to be born again and to be made new, the prayer team will be here. They would love to pray with you. They would love to encourage you. And they would love to lead you to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. But like that woman, you've got to take the first step. Like that woman, you've got to enter into the place where you're willing to let Jesus transform your life. Hebrews 13, eight says that Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, and forever. And that means the same compassionate Jesus that we saw in scripture, exists today, cares for you today, and wants to bring healing and hope to your life today. If he cared for the hurting people 2,000 years ago, he cares for the hurting people today. Let's pray together. God, thank you for your word and thank you for this example in scripture of how Jesus does care for us, that he cares for the broken, the hurting, he cares for those that the world has given up on. Thank you for that example. Lord, it's our prayer that you would continue to transform lives. It's our prayer that those without Jesus today would yield their lives to you and surrender to you and experience that hope and that grace. And Lord, even if they're not ready to today, Lord, that you would continue to bring them into the church. You would continue to bring them hope. And you, Lord, you would allow them to experience incredible grace. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.